situations where you need freedom of speech most, at those moments, at those moments you don't have it. Uh, that doesn't speak well for how much democracy we have, whatever is written in the Constitution and whatever is told to us in junior high school. Well, uh, One of the requirements, I suppose, of a democracy is a well-informed public. And, and one of the media for a well-informed public is the media, the, the, the newspapers and television and radio. And uh, they're supposed to help us. Uh, they're supposed to, that's their job. They're professionals. They have the time. They're supposed to investigate what the government does they're supposed to be like I.F. Stone, but they're not, you say. Uh, they're supposed to uh, inform the public what's going on and be critical of what is happening and be a kind of intermediary between the government and the people. But what do we find instead? We find the media, the mass media, the big media, the corporate-owned media of this country are going along with war. I mean, all, you, all your president has to do is declare a war, and immediately the media come on board. And you saw this right at the beginning, beginning of the Iraq war. And you saw the flags go up on the stands of the television commentators. And, and you saw, uh, you heard Dan Rather saying, talking about uh, the decisions made by the government to go to war, using the word we, immediately associating himself. Uh, I'm just a small example of the obsequiousness of the press. Uh, in, in situations of uh, war and, and near war and impending war. And you, you remember that uh, a month before uh, we went to war uh, in Iraq in February of, of uh, 2003, Colin Powell made that famous speech before the UN, in which he laid out this long, long list of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, probably uh, there's no speech ever made at the UN that contained more falsehoods in one speech than that one. Uh, did the press ask questions? <laughs> did they ask, uh, hey, where's your evidence? Did they remember that two years before Colin Powell being nominated for his post had said, Iran, Iraq is a, Iraq is a, is a beaten country. Iran is a weak and helpless country. That was two years before. Hadn't they remembered that since then there had been hundreds and hundreds of inspections of Iraq by an international team that had found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction? For when Colin Powell made a speech, the big newspapers climbed on board immediately. I mean, the New York Times fell all over itself in admiration of the speech. Uh, I mean, and, and by now, you know, it is accustomed to that acrobatic feat. And the Washington Post uh, said, it is hard to imagine how anyone could doubt that Iraq possesses weapons of mass destruction. Uh, well, can't depend on the press. Uh, and the public is on its own. That's an important thing to know, that we are on our own, that the, the checks and balances won't help us and the press won't help us. We are on our own as citizens. If democracy is to have any life, it will have it because of us and not because of the organs of government, not even because of the Constitution, because the Constitution can be set aside very easily and is being set aside. Uh, so it's up to us, but we have problems. Uh, in uh, knowing what is going on for a number of reasons. One of them is a loss of history. If we are not given a, a, a really good historical education, we're not really in a position to understand what is going on. Uh, if we don't know history, it's as if we were born yesterday. And if you're born yesterday, anybody in authority can get up before the microphone and say, we must go to war for this reason or that reason or another reason. And you have no basis for uh, challenging that. Uh, and if you know some history, it's a different matter. 
And when I say no history, I don't mean the history we get, yes, again, in junior high school, and in high school, and in college, and, so, and in the university, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I went all through you know, the history program right up to the PhD, and I must say that there was a lot that was missing in that history. Uh, so I, no, I don't mean the history that, that uh, glows with admiration for our various presidents. Uh, Doom Andrew Jackson is a hero, the Andrew Jackson, the racist, the Indian killer, the slave owner, to whom Theodore Roosevelt is a hero, Theodore Roosevelt, the lover of war, the defender of massacres in the Philippines, uh, you know, the, the, those laudatory uh, histories of uh, military heroes. I don't mean that kind of history. I mean a history which, which is uh, critical, which is, uh, which is in independent of previous histories, uh, of, the, of the tradition of independent of, of orthodox history. No, if you, but if you knew some history uh, which you learned by yourself, or which you got from the library, because the library is always a much, much better source uh, of information uh, than what you can get in the press, and very often what you can get in the institutions of learning. Uh, and and, uh, and if, you get, if you had that kind of history, uh, then uh, when the president gets up to tell you you're to war, you would be skeptical, because you would know how often presidents have lied to the public in order to get them into war. You would know about how President Polk lied to the American nation about the Mexican War in 1846. And, oh, well, you know, there's been a clash on the border, and American blood has been shed on American soil. Wow. You know, it's like Pearl Harbor. It's like the Gulf of Tonkin. I'm jumping a little ahead with my... <laughs> you know, but, you know, I don't have that much time, you see. And... Uh, And, uh, and lies told for every war. Lies told about the Spanish America. You know, oh, we're going into Cuba to liberate the Cubans from Spanish rule. Uh, well, sort of a half truth. We did liberate the Cubans from Spanish rule, but not from our rule. Spain was out, we were in. Spain was out, and United Fruit was in. Spain was out, and the American banks and the American corporations were in, and now Cuba was ours until that terrible moment in 1959 that you know, when Castro ruined everything. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and because we're against dictators, we're against, you know, we want democracy. And so we supported all of his dictatorial predecessors until, until he came along. But Cuba was ours. Uh, and lies told about the Philippine War, and lies told about World War I, and lies and go on and on and on. And you know about the more recent lies, the lies about the Gulf of Tonkin, and, and about Panama and Grenada. And there, was, there, was always a, there was always a reason for going to war. And it turned out, of course, that those were not the real reasons. They were motives. There were other motives that were not told to us. Uh, we're not told that the that, uh, reason we get into the Mexican War is not because of this clash on the border, but because President Polk wanted California. I mean, who can blame him? <laughs> but uh, he wanted California. Uh, he wanted that whole great, beautiful area of the Southwest, which is now ours, and which now trying to keep the Mexicans out of. <laughs> trying to keep them out of the land we stole from them. This is really, you know, it, yes, of course. Uh, you know, lies, yeah. Uh, yeah, there were murders. We were told one thing, and then there were real reasons for going into these places. Uh, we were told that we were going into the Philippines to you know, bring civilization and Christianity to the Filipinos. Yeah. We brought death and destruction to them. And why? <laughs> was, it, was it to bring democracy? Was it to bring civilization and Christianity to the Filipinos? No, it was because the Philippines were a, a wonderful entry to the mineral wealth of, of all of Asia. I mean, Senator Albert Beveridge of Indiana sort of held up a nugget, gold nugget, in, in the Senate and said, this is what they have in the Philippines. They were a little more honest then. <laughs> you don't see a senator's getting up now and say, and here is a gallon of oil. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so yes, a little knowledge of history uh, would make people more skeptical uh, when the government urges us uh, to go to war. And uh, mind if I have a swig? <laughs> it's not water. I think one of the reasons we're, uh, we're not ready to be uh, skeptical is that we, I think we grow up in this country with the idea that uh, the government is looking out for our interests. In other words, if something goes wrong, it's because the government has made a mistake. They really care about us. They really want to do the right thing by us. It's just that they make mistakes. We cannot get it through our heads that the government may not be making mistakes. It may have different interests than us. That is all that language that we get in the culture about uh, the national defense and the national interest and national security, all those abstractions which bind us all together. Those first words in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people of the United States. And so we all grow up with the idea that, yeah, we're all you know one big, happy family, and that all of our interests are the same. Uh, but uh, some history would disabuse us of that. I mean, really, but you mean George Bush's interests are the same as the interests of the young person he sends to Iraq? You mean Exxon's interests are the same as the interests of working people in this country who may work for Exxon? Um, no. Uh, well, some, yes, some history would show us that from the beginning, uh, this country was un not united by a common interest. Uh, lo long before the American Revolution, there were clashes all through the American colonies between landlords and tenants, between slaves and slave owners. Uh, there were riots of the poor in Boston and Philadelphia and New York. And then when the revolution came, although we, we learned very often in uh, you know, in our history courses that, well, you know, there were the united uh, colonists uh, uh, against England and British oppression. They weren't, were not united at all. Uh, the working guys went into the revolution very often because they were promised land, not because they, they had any notions, notion that they had common interests with the, well, with the founding fathers. Uh, and... Uh, and in fact, you know, there were mutinies in the, and this I, I never learned in school, uh, there were mutinies in the Revolutionary Army against uh, Washington and the officers uh, because of the way the privates were treated, uh, their lack of food, their lack of clothes, their lack of pay, and the way the officers were treated with splendid clothes and plenty of money. Uh, mutinies of thousands of soldiers in Washington's army. And then when the Revolutionary War ended, that conflict continued. Rebellions of farmers in Massachusetts and other places. Probably you know about Shays' Rebellion. Many people know about it only because it appears on multiple choice tests. <laughs> uh, but Shays' Rebellion yeah, was a huge uprising of thousands and thousands of farmers in western Massachusetts and emulated in other states. Uh, poor, many of them veterans of the Revolutionary War facing the same problem that veterans of any war face and that is when they, they come home and they find that the promises made to them as veterans are not being kept. And they find that the, the country which they thought they had fought for is not exactly the same. Uh, there was a, an, uh, after Shays' Rebellion, there was a letter written by, to Washington by uh, one of his men who was a general with Washington, Henry Knox. And, uh, and after Shays' Rebellion, which put a, a kind of fear into the founding fathers. Remember, Shays' Rebellion was 1786. The Constitution was 1787. And after Shays' Rebellion, Knox wrote to Washington and he said, uh, well, I'm paraphrasing, uh, they wrote more elegantly in those days. Uh, our founding fathers, whatever you can say about them, 
They could write. <laughs> they could speak, you know. Uh, so anything critical that I may say of them should be, you know, uh, leavened by that thought. Uh, and, uh, but Knox said to Washington, after Shays' Rebellion, he said, these people out in Western Massachusetts, they think that because they fought in the revolution, they deserve an equal share of the wealth of this country. No. The Constitution was not drawn up for the benefit of all and the common interests of all. The Constitution was drawn up by men of means, by slaveholders and merchants, and, and it was drawn up basically to pre present a strong central government, which would be able to put down rebellions, which would be able to put down slave rebellions, would be, would be able to protect the settlers as they moved out west to get rid of the Indians who thought it was their land. Uh, conflict from the beginning, well, different interests from the beginning, from the revolution on, from before the revolution and after the revolution, down to the present day. You can trace it in the legislation that Congress passes all through history, class legislation. Legislation that serves the interests of the privileged all through, the subsidies to the railroads, the subsidies to the corporations. Uh, there were moments when there was a break in that. There were moments when, when Congress did pass legislation for the poor. Those were moments when people rebelled, like the 30s and the great strikes of the 30s or the 60s when the great movements of the 60s. And then we got some reforms. But in general, the history of legislation in this country is a history that is class legislation. So I always get a kick out of it when election time, one candidate says of the other, uh, accusingly, he's appealing to class antagonism. Uh, well, <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Uh, so, uh, There's another problem we have in uh, being skeptical, another sort of psychological, ideological obstacle to being uh, properly critical, to seeing our nation and its policies very clearly. And that is what, well, it's what social scientists call uh, American exceptionalism. The myth of American exceptionalism, the idea that we're the best, we're the greatest, uh, we're number one. Well, there, there are ways in which we are number one, and there are ways in which we are great, and there, there are a lot of really good things you can say about this country. But to blanketly declare us the best and the most virtuous, and uh, that's going too far. And that's where history comes in handy. History makes us honest. It's not a matter of putting ourselves down. It's a matter of being honest about ourselves and our past. I mean, you can't say as many people that, well, it's true. No, I mean, this is a great country. Sure, we've had our little problems, like slavery, you know. <laughs> but basically, you know, well, no, it's not, it's not as simple as that. Uh, and our, our history is, is a history of even a country of great wealth, enough wealth to create a middle class, uh, uh, but a country which has always had an underclass, a large underclass, where the wealth has always been unequally and unfairly distributed, a country of slavery and then of a uh, hundred years of racial segregation after slavery. And remember, it's very recent, only very recent, that racial segregation in this country was outlawed. So, uh, and then of course our activities abroad, they say, well, in the United States, we're the good guys of the world. Oh, well, we've made a few mistakes here and there. No, we haven't been the good guys of the world. No. But that's the, what you grow up with. We're, we're the Boy Scouts of the world. We help nations across the street. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we haven't. And sometimes we've helped other countries. Most often we have not. Most often our aims have been imperial. Oh. And uh, 
in the record of the United States is a record of expansion, of continual expansion, first across the continent, destroying Native American tribes, annihilating them, pushing them farther and farther into smaller parts of the country, and then moving into the Caribbean, and then moving into uh, the Pacific, uh, and of course uh, into Latin America, and, and recently, of course, all over the world. And it, and it hasn't, hasn't been a, a picture of, of benign imperialism, as some people like to think of it. Well, we're imperial, but uh, they even use the term imperialism light, <laughs> which uh, may be okay for a beer, but not for imperialism. Uh, and this uh, idea You all have a right to take out your bottles of water. <laughs> I feel that I'm sort of taking advantage of the situation. Uh, this, uh, this idea of, of us being the greatest and so on, very often it's accompanied by the idea that God has given us special dispensation. And, uh, and this, this goes way back, goes back to you know, the first governor of Massachusetts, goes back to the middle of the 19th century and the idea of manifest destiny and the, that providence, that's the word they use, providence has ordained that we move across the continent and as if God believed in ethnic cleansing. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, Wilson invoked God. It's interesting, all this talk about this sort of uh, very pompous talk about diff, you know, the separation of church and state. There's never been a separation of church and state. Every president has invoked God to uh, support what he has done. Wilson did it all the time. And, uh, and Clinton did it. And of course, Bush has carried it to, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I mean, before Bush, of course, McKinley had said uh, God told him to take the Philippines. Uh, and he did. So, <laughs> Bush, uh, uh, and Bush, this is reported in Haaretz newspaper in Israel, that uh, the Palestinian leader reported this, that he had spoken to Bush, and Bush told him, quote, God told me to strike Al-Qaeda, and I struck them. And then he instructed me to strike at Saddam, which I did. Well, uh, it's a little suspect, actually, that, <laughs> that, you know, it's a sort of secondhand source, and, and, it, <laughs> and the grammar isn't quite right. Uh, there's a more likely source, and this is a, a, an official of the Southern Baptist Convention who says that during, uh, during Bush's first campaign, Bush said to him, I believe God wants me to be president. But if that doesn't happen, that's okay. I thought that was generous. Uh, 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 but... Uh, so I think we, we need to be honest about the historical record. I, um, the people, I, I think, that portion of our population uh, which is least susceptible to the claim that you know, we are the greatest and so on and we have liberty and democracy and so on. I think the people who are naturally most skeptical of this are black people in this country for, I guess, understandable reasons. And uh, in the 1930s, uh, uh, Langston Hughes, the uh, African-American poet of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, 
wrote a poem a, 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 entitled Columbia, Columbia representing the United States. <clears throat> and uh, uh, now this is the 1930s, and the United States had not yet uh, gone as far as it has since then. But by the 1930s, it had already gone into Cuba and taken Puerto Rico and taken Hawaii and taken the Philippines and sent Marines 20 times into uh, Central America. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, the great idealist, had bombarded the Mexican coast and, uh, and sent an occupying army into Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So it, there was already a record for Langston Hughes when he wrote, uh, Columbia, my dear girl, uh, you really haven't been a virgin so long. It's ludicrous to keep up a pretext. You're terribly involved in world assignations and everybody knows it. You've slept with all the big powers in military uniforms and you've taken the sweet life of all the little brown fellows in loincloths and cotton trousers. Being one of the world's big vampires, why don't you come on out and say so? Like Japan and England and France and all the other nymphomaniacs of power. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> honesty, that's what we need. We need a, a, some forthright acknowledgement. I mean, people are apologizing all over the place for ridiculous things. <laughs> Let's apologize for really important, important things. And, uh, you know, don't... Uh, isn't that what they do in Alcoholics Anonymous? Don't they get up and, on, and just tell the truth about themselves, right? So why can't, why can't we have Imperialists Anonymous? <laughs> and uh, you know, and have, you know, have the people in the White House and so on, you know, get up before the world and, and yeah, confess. <laughs> uh, so when you... Uh, looking at my watch to pretend that I care. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you talk the way I'm talking, which of course is nasty, it, you know, it's really, it's, it's hard to take because we're not, a, you know, we're not accustomed to talking this way or to listening to stuff like this and uh, and when you, t when, you, when you are so critical of the policies that our government has followed, and uh, what happens, you, you're immediately called unpatriotic, un-American, right? You, you don't like America. Wait a while. You mean Bush is America? You mean those people in the White House are America? Uh, uh, they say, well, you're putting down our country. Our country? Uh, no, not our country. You see these young fellows and all young women going off to Iraq and the television cameras on them and they're asking them, why are you going to Iraq? And they say, well, I believe I owe this to my country. No, they're not going there for their country. They're not going there for the good of their families and their community and the people of this country. They're going there for Bush. They're going there for Halliburton. They're going there for Bechtel. That's who they're going there for. Uh, but there's this confusion between the government and the country. We shouldn't be confused because we should be reading the Declaration of Independence. And that's our founding philosophical document. The Declaration of Independence makes the distinction clear that governments are artificial creations. They are set up by the people to ensure certain rights, an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when governments become destructive of these ends, those are the, these are the words of the Declaration, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government. Now that's serious. But that's the Declaration of Independence. That's why it's put up on the classroom wall, not to be read, but to be looked at. Uh, uh, so uh, when you criticize the government, uh, you're not criticizing a country, you're not criticizing America. And when a government is acting against the interests of the people, when the government is not fulfilling its obligation to bring 
equality, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness to its citizens, then the government is being unpatriotic. Uh, so it's, I think it's very important to, to get that clear. Yeah. Uh, of course, our capacity to think clearly about all this uh, becomes distorted when a climate of fear is created, when, an, when some horrible menace is declared uh, to uh, threaten us. Uh, and different points in, the, in history, you know, the, the menace changes, but in the 1950s and during the Cold War, it was communism. Now, there are real threats. There are realities. And then there are exaggerations of those threats to the point of hysteria. And sure, there was the Soviet Union, and there the Soviet Union had occupied countries in Eastern Europe, but the communist threat was magnified to the point where any revolution, any uprising taking place anywhere uh, in the world was part of a world communist conspiracy. And so millions of people died in Vietnam uh, because uh, people were made hysterical about communism. Uh, and this country has spent trillions of dollars on war uh, for the purpose of defending ourselves uh, against a menace that was enormously exaggerated. Uh, and uh, that fear, communism, now is a fear of terrorism. Uh, and terrorism is used as a way to make people stop thinking. Uh, and, uh, and as a justification for everything that is done to us, and as a justification for stealing the wealth of this country, and as a justification for taking away our liberties, and as a justification for going to war again and again, uh, and not giving people a chance to think about war and the war on terrorism. And how can you make war on terrorism when terrorism itself is war? And war is terrorism. War is the greatest terrorism. The terrorism of small bands of people who blow up and buildings and who are suicide bombers, I mean, that's bad, and that is terrorism. But that's very small compared to the terrorism of governments. Governments have enormous capacity to kill millions of people, and they do. Uh, but that is concealed from us by making us focus, focus on these bands of people who are terrorists. Uh, so we need to think about the way terrorism is used. We need, uh, uh, and we need to think about war itself. I, I don't mean just this war. I don't mean just the war in Iraq. Because we will, uh, the war in Iraq will come to an end. I don't know when, but it will come to an end at some point. Who knows at what cost, but it will come to an end. It, it has to because we, we don't belong in Iraq. This, the, our, our presence there is already crumbling and crumbling, and we are not going to stay in Iraq. Uh, and so the war in Iraq may be over at some point. But then what about the next war and the next war and the next war? Are we going to have anti-war movement after anti-war movement after anti-war movement? It seems to me we must, and I know this is a big big job. You must think about the abolition of war itself. War. War is the enemy. War. You know. You know. And uh, we have to come to a recognition that war solves no fundamental problems. I say this as somebody who was in a war. Uh, and uh, no, not the Spanish-American War. <laughs> Uh, but I was in the good war, the best of wars. Uh, I mean, the war which has probably the greatest claim to any kind of moral center, and yet that war was accompanied by atrocities of all kinds, whether it's Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Dresden, or a bombing raid that I engaged in uh, and dropping napalm on a little French village, or uh, battles which killed huge numbers of people. Uh, no. Uh, that war uh, 
the good war, uh, which you might say is the, is the uh, putting war to the extreme test, and even that war was deeply, deeply flawed in the moral sense. And every war since has not even had that moral core, and yet World War II is used as a metaphor for all these other wars. They draw upon the, the language of World War II and Churchill and appeasement and Munich and all of that. They draw upon the moral capital of World War II uh, to put a glow on every ugly war we have fought since World War II. Uh, I mean, war has reached a point with the technology of war where it cannot be accepted as a way of solving any problem in the world, whether there's a dictator somewhere, whether a border has been crossed. It cannot be accepted as a war, by definition, is the massive and indiscriminate killing of innocent people. War has become more and more the killing of civilians. In World War I, the ratio of military